boss. I said, excuse me, sir. Have you seen the Quran? He says, no, do that. So, would you like to have a look at it, sir? He said, have you got an English translation? I said, yes, sir. He says, no, I don't mind. So, I had this same Quran, but in three volumes. Originally published in India, Pakistan. Cheap paper, so it had to become very bulky, so I had to make it in three volumes. Ten, ten, ten separas. We call it separas, juice. So, I took this Quran out. Between one couple, I gave one volume. Between the second couple, I gave another volume. And to my boss, I gave him the last volume. It has an index. So, I deliberately gave him the last volume. So, they all started opening, seeing inside. What's, what does it look like? What's? So, I'm suggesting to my boss. I said, excuse me, sir. You see, at the ba back of that volume you have, there's an index. Look up the subject, Moses. So he opened the index, Moses, Moses, there are dozens of references about Moses, everything that you want to know, man, in the index. Jesus, everything about Jesus. What do you want to know? In this Quran, everything on your fingertips. So he found Moses. I said, sir, if you want to check up actually what it says, you know, these are the headings. Have a look, see what it says. So he opened somewhere, he opened somewhere else. Then he looks at me. He says, D that, this book is very funny. <laughs> so what's funny about it, sir? What's funny about it, sir? He said, no, you see, this book seems to be speaking in our favor. But you people are all against us. You Muslims. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he has been reading about Musa al and Firon in the confrontation with the Egyptians. The Egyptians set hard tasks for these people, made them to make bricks without straw, and they killed their sons and kept their daughters alive. And that was also a bitter, severe trial, keeping your daughters alive. And as they are growing, you know, the Egyptians are watching, your daughters growing up, 12, 14, developing, mm -hmm, is making his mouth water. You know, he's going to use them. These Egyptians, they did terrible, cruel things. I said, no, that is true, sir. You see, sir, your people were a God-fearing people. You believed in God. The Egyptians were mushriks. They were idolatrous people. And they said, hard task for you people. Injustice is committed against you. So God tells us so objectively that, look, these people were wrong. The Egyptians were wrong. And Allah saved these Jews from the Egyptian bondage. Right. But today, sir, I said, you see, the position is different. You see, you have usurped our lands. You stole our lands. I said, Didat, how can you say that? <laughs> Palestine belongs to us. Palestine belongs to us. I said, how, sir? How, sir? How? He said, no, God promised it to us. I said, where, sir? Oh, he knew his Bible. He's a businessman, but he knew his Bible. He said, in the book of Genesis, chapter 17, verse 8, God speaks to Hazrat Ibrahim al to the prophet Abraham. He says, I will give unto thee, to you, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, Palestine, for an everlasting possession, and I will be the God to see that they have it. I'll protect them. So God gave it to us. He promised it to us. That's his title deed. That's his title deed to Palestine. The Jews' title deed. It's in the Bible. And this is what they programmed the whole Western world. The Christians, the Americans are all programmed, brainwashed. So look here, here, the Bible that you own, the Christians. The Old Testament is the Bible of the Jews. The Christians accept it. As the word of God. So look here. Genesis chapter 17 verse 8. God gave it to us. And these Arab barbarians. They won't allow us to live in peace. Look what they are doing to us. So the simple. They, say, look, they can see the Americans and the British and the French. They can see the, 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 the tyranny and the cruelty of the Jews. But they say, what can we do? Man. You see God gave it to them. And these barbarians. They will not allow these people to live in peace. So. We know it's wrong, what they're doing, bulldozing people, breaking their arms. This is not right. But what can we do? <laughs> this is God's promise. God says, give it to them. Let them have it, man. Programming, brainwashing. The whole Western world, the Christian world is brainwashed. This man here, honestly, says, look, did that? this is promised by God to us. So I said, Mr. Beer, 
you see in your book, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 21, God says, this is the book of Moses supposed to be, his Torah, God says, that how are you to know whether the thing that is spoken by the prophet is from God or not? He says, God gives the answer to that. He poses the question and he gives the answer. He says, if the thing that the prophet says, if it does not come to pass, it does not happen, that is the thing the Lord has not spoken. But the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. Right? He said, right. Is that a valid test? He said, yes. It's a valid test for applying to any prophecy, any basharat, anything that's going to happen in the future. This is a valid test. As given in the Bible. I said, shall we apply this to this prophecy? He said, yes. Yes, it's reasonable. We can apply this test. So I said, you see, sir, God promises Abraham, according to you, all the land of Canaan, the whole of Palestine, for an everlasting possession. And he said, I will be the God. I'll see to it that they are protected. The, all the land of Palestine. But I says, you know, sir, when Abraham died, he didn't own one square foot of land. According to your Bible. He was buried on a piece of land that was purchased by his son Ismail and Ishaq. They went to bury the father. But it was, he was buried on a purchased piece of land. And the Bible just says that when they died, they lived in hopes, not having received the promises. And Abraham didn't own one square foot of land. Not enough land to rest his foot upon. It means not even one square foot of land he owned. So if God offered him the whole of Palestine and he didn't get one square foot, that means that is not the promise of God. In the Quran we are told, Wa'ad Allah haq. If Allah makes a promise, his promise is true. If this is Allah's promise, he will fulfill it. If it is not, he said, Wa'ad Allah haq. My book tells me. And he didn't own one square foot of land. So that is not the promise of God. <sighs> Punctured. No, he's a reasonable man. He's my boss. But he's reasonable. He's punctured. But I didn't want to <laughs> cut short the story. I wanted to pursue the matter further. So I said, you see, sir, according to you, you are disqualified. This is not the promise of God. But I am prepared to concede. That God did make such a promise. I am prepared to concede. As if Palestine was my father's property. I am prepared to give. I am prepared to give away. As if Palestine was my father's property. I said look. I am prepared to concede. That God did make such a promise. Although you are disqualified. From your own book. The test. I am prepared to concede. What is the promise? Let's read it. He said I will give unto thee. And to thy seed after thee. Who is the seed of Abraham? He said, we the Jews. I said, no doubt you are the seed of Abraham, but are you the only seed? In the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, no less than 12 times, no less than 12 times, this God Almighty, in your book, he speaks about Ishmael. He tells Abraham, as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I'll make him a great nation, because he is thy seed. He is your seed. And as for Ishmael, thy son, and as for Ishmael, thy seed, no less than twelve times in your Bible, Ishmael is spoken of as the son and seed of Abraham. Then what right have you to deny him that birthright? If your God says in your book, son, as for, as for Ishmael, thy son, as for Ishmael, thy seed, and as for 12 times in your book, the first book of the Bible, has that Ishmael is spoken of as the son and seed of Abraham. What right have you to deny him that? No doubt you are also the seed of Abraham, the Jews. Hazrat Ibrahim a.s. had two sons, Ismail and Ishaq. The Arabs are the children of Ismail a.s. And, Is and the Jews are the children of Hazrat Ishaq a.s. You are all both brothers. You are both the seed of Abraham. Why should you not live in peace and harmony in that country? If it was offered to the seed of Abraham, then both the seeds you should live as brothers. He said, you see, did that. We had this under David and Solomon. You know, we own this place. So, we have taken it back. We just took back what was ours. We had it. Th thousand years before Jesus was born. 
We had this place. David ruled it. Solomon ruled it. Uh -huh. But I said, how did you get it, sir? You came from Egypt, a slave nation, a unified people, community, and you knocked hells into the Palestinians. The Bible says, in one day, in one day, the Jews killed 30 kings. That means they conquered 30 kingdoms. In one day. Hitler couldn't do any such thing. In one day, 30 kings. What they are talking about is this, this village chief, the king, you call him a king. Well, you conquered him. You're a unified nation, 12 tribes coming together. And this one little villager hmm, killed him. Another villager killed him and took his place to 30 kingdoms that conquered in one day. 30 kings. It's like childish thing you're talking, man. You know, 30 kingdoms and 30 kings. No. So, I said, now how did you take it? By force of arms. And by force of arms, if you have a right to possess somebody else's land, then by force of arms, if the Arabs want to take it back, you have no right to complain. What's good for you, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. It should be both equal. If you can take it by force of arms, then if the Arabs are trying to take it away from you by force of arms, you shouldn't complain. But he says, do that. You see, we have it. And possession is nine-tenth of the law. Nine-tenth of the law. Possession is nine-tenth. You got it, man. Now to wrench it, it's yours. But to get it out of his hand, it's a, it's a job. It's a job. Possession is... So we possess it. So I said, look, you had it. A thousand years ago, you had this place. We also had Eid, Spain. We Muslims ruled Spain for 800 years. If we have the power once more again, can we go and claim Spain? He said, our fathers built the Alhambra. You know, fountains and gardens and shh, monumental buildings. Allah describes it in the Holy Quran. Kam tarakum in jannatim wa uyun. How many were the gardens and the fountains they left behind? Wazum wa makam in kareem and cornfields and monumental buildings. Wa ni'matin kanu fiha faqihin. And wealth and the amenities of life in which they took so much delight. All these things left by my forefathers. Have I a right to go and claim it? If you had the power. Can you go and claim Spain? So our fathers had it. He says, no. Can the Dutch go and claim Indonesia once more again? He says, we ruled it for 300 years. He says, no. Can the Portuguese reclaim Mozambique? He says, we ruled it for 500 years. He says, no. Then what right have you to Palestine? <laughs> because your fathers had it. You have a right? You have no right. How did you get it? Hmm. This thing carried on. And at the end, Mr. Beer, my boss, tells me, this is D that we didn't know that the Arabs had a case. No program from childhood. Palestine belongs to us. And these Arab barbarians, they won't allow us to live in peace. So now they are fighting with a spirit of jihad. This is our land, our possession. God gave it to us. We must protect it. That's programming. Programming. You have to reprogram the people. He said, we didn't know that the Arabs had a case. Do that. I want you to write what you told me. And I will publish it in my Temple David magazine. He was an editor of a reform synagogue, Jewish church. He said, you write this and I will publish it in my Temple David magazine. I said, Mr. Beer, I can't write. I'm not a writer. He said, I can easily talk anything. At the drop of a pin, I can get started. I can talk. But writing is an ordeal. He said, no, no, do that. You just write as you say, and I will improve it for you. And he meant it. He meant it. But I didn't reach that stage of writing what I had spoken. What do you think my position in the firm next day? Fired. No, no. No. From next morning, I am Mr. D. Dad. He comes in. To the shop, he says, good morning, Mr. D. Dad. He goes for lunch, he says, good afternoon, Mr. D. Dad. He goes out in the evening, he says, good evening, Mr. D. Dad. D. Dad becomes Mr. D. Dad. No, no, no. Allah says, Min humul mu'minu. Now, among them, there are good people. Wa humul fasikun. But the majority of them are perverted transgressors. There are goodly people among them. Now, he goes and tells the other Jews in the establishment. He says, this guy D. Dad, you know that dispatch clerk. Hey, that guy, he knows something. You know, he made rings around me, around him. 
So I'm passing by with my dust coat, white dust coat I used to wear, uh, walking around the shop, doing my work. And one of the managers of the clothing department, Mr. Baynard by name, not the Jew, he comes and says, did that come here? I say, yes, sir. He says, you know, you made rings around Mr. Beer. But you can't do it to me. You know, as for Ishmael, Ishmael was a bastard. Hazrat Ismail al What would an Arab do? Tell me, tell me. Knife him. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> if you don't know any, what, look, the guy calls our progenitor, Hazrat Ismail al Islam, a bastard. You are, you are entitled to put a knife through the guy. <laughs> no matter what they call you afterward, terrorist and what, fanatic and what and what not. But no, you see, once you know that you got the guy, when he said that, I said, I got him. Right? There's no time to argue and debate in the shop. Because as soon as we start, the boss comes along and says, you run away, finish. And then you can't get to it again. This, this is a business, business time. And you don't do things like that. You don't start arguing and debating there and there. He said, Mr. Bainhart, why don't you come home with your wife? And, you know, we will chat about these matters. But you can't do to me what you did to Mr. Beer. I said, who's talking about doing anything? You know, I'm telling you. Right. Now, from there on, every time I pass by, I said, you know, I spoke to my wife. About you, sir. And she's looking forward to you and your wife coming and visiting us for dinner. You know, every time. He said, you know, my wife is still asking, when you coming? When you coming? Shh. Pressure. Pressure is on. Come home, you know, with your friends. Come home. He said, you can't do to me what you did to me. I said, who's talking about doing anything, man? You come home. <laughs> <laughs> I persuaded him. So Mr. and Mrs. Beer, Baynard comes along. And Mr. and Mrs. Peel, Christians. And Mr. Townsend. He was a backroom boy for the uh, full gospel church. Three Christians and two Jews. But the Jews were the primary uh, guests of mine. Same process, same food, same masjid, visit to the masjid, come back again, same tea and samosas. <laughs> right, now we are settled down, relaxed. I said, Mr. Baynard, you remember you told me in the shop that Ishmael was a bastard? He said, yes. I said, do you still stand by that? He said, of course. I thought maybe the tea and the samosas and the food might have changed his mind. <laughs> no, it had no effect. No effect. He said, yes. So I said, all right. All right, Mr. Benat, tell me now. According to Judaism, your religion, the rule religion has given to you, Judaism, which is preferable for a man to marry his own sister and be a child by her or marry a slave woman? An African woman. Between these two alternatives, your own sister, you're going to get a child from her, have sex with her, and be get a child from your own sister, or an African woman, a slave woman, who is preferable according to your religion? He says, no, the African woman is preferable. I say, according to eugenics, genetics, which is preferable? For you to be get a child from your own sister, a bastard child, from your own sister, or from an African woman? A negress. That's what they say. Hajra was a slave woman, born woman from Egypt. She was actually a princess of Egypt. But uh, let us stay, whatever they say, is right. She was a slave woman, a born woman, an African woman, a negress. But between these two, your sister and this, which is preferable? He says, no, that negress is preferable. According to the science of eugenics, sex, genetics. I said, according to your common sense. Between these two alternatives, which is preferable? He said, no, the African woman, the slave woman, the bond woman is preferable. That's got the right answers. The answers are right. That's right. Open your book, book of Genesis. Your own book, your Bible. It says that Abraham went to a certain place and the king of the place saw Sarah. She was beautiful, the Hebrew woman. Mm. And he took a liking for her. So he's asking Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam. He said, what is this woman to you? So the Bible says, he said, she is my sister. He said, right, send her in into the haram. Send her in. In the prerogative of kings. In those days, the king says, your sister, your mother, your daughter, anybody, send her in. And you say, no, chop off your head. 
So he's got no alternative. He sends his wife, Sarah, into the king's harem. And the Bible says, this guy couldn't come right with her. Whole night he struggled. I don't know what was the reason. The Bible doesn't explain what was going on. But whole night he struggled. Frustrated in the morning. He wants to know from Ibrahim, what is this woman to you? Because on account of her I had a restless night. He had come right with every woman that he has handled so far. But he couldn't come right with Sarah. What? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But he couldn't come right. So he wants to know, what is this woman to you? Now he says, she is my wife. He said, why didn't, why didn't you tell me a lie? You know, you are a man of God. If I had done something wrong to her, God could have destroyed me. Why did you lie to me? So, according to his Bible, he says, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he says, for indeed she is my sister. I didn't lie to you. She is my sister. But of the same father, but different mother. Same father means father seed. It's your sister. And she became my wife. So, I said, according to Judaism, according to your eugenics, according to your common sense, Hajra's child was preferable. If Ishmael is a bastard, then Isaac is a greater bastard. According to Judaism, every, every, every test that you have, your, your, your progenitor is a greater bastard. Look, Astaghfirullah, we don't talk like that. But now this is the only language the guy understands. See, he's used that language. So I said, look, if Ishmael is a bastard because he's the son of a born woman, then your is Ishaq is a greater bastard, brother and sister, sex incest, that's incest, and eugenics and common sense from every point of view, your Isaac is a greater bastard, so your progeny is worse than that of Ishmael. <laughs> The Quran says, Ya Bani Israel, Askuru, Ni'mati Allati Anamta Alaikum. So, O children of Israel, remember the special favors which I did unto you. Wa anni faddaltukum al alameen. That I preferred you above all the peoples of the earth for my special favors. He chose you. You say you are a chosen people. I say, Yes, you are a chosen people. You say it's in the Bible. I say it's also in the Quran. You are a chosen people. Chosen for what? Because of your race? Because of your language? Because of your riches? No. You were chosen for a purpose. And that purpose is spelled out for you in, in, in your Torah, in the Bible, in the second book of the Bible called Exodus. Moses is made to say, Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 and 6. He says, Moses, now therefore, if ye will obey my voice, God is speaking through Moses, if you Jews will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me, something special. If you listen to God's voice, listen to his commandments, become right with him, he says, you will be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. Quran says, That I preferred you above all the peoples of the earth for my special favors. For all the earth is mine, says the Lord. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's your job. You are supposed to be a kingdom of priests. Guide mankind to the knowledge of God. That, that was the role that why God chose you. Now you have done away with that role. You have made your religion a racial religion. All the strife in the world, whatever happened in Germany, whatever happened for the past 2000 years, is on account of that you have lost that role. You are done away with that role. And if you do not carry out the duties and responsibilities which God has imposed upon you for making you the chosen people, he says in the book of Leviticus, the fourth book of Moses, chapter 26, verse 18. And after all this, if you do not obey me, God is talking. You Jews, if you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. There is a chance. There is a growing number of people among the Jews. There are people among the Jews who are crying for the, about the injustice, that you are worse than the Nazis. You're doing things that the, what the Nazis didn't do to you, you are doing to these poor Palestinians. And this is... As soon as the world opinion, the world is realizing, you know, not everybody is not asleep. They are knowing what's going on now. Day by day, more and more things are coming in the news. Daily, they are killing little children. Little, little children are being killed daily. This is the fate. 
in the Times Magazine, Times Magazine, the weekly news magazine, International, we read there the Palestinian question. So what manner of man would retaliate against a stone-throwing child by shooting him in the back as he ran away? What kind of people are these who would shoot a stone-throwing child by shooting him in the back as he ran away? What manner of government would retaliate by finding already poverty-stricken parents a thousand dollars, demolishing their home and confiscating their meager possessions? What manner of people are these arrogant settlers who think they have a God-given right to commit such atrocities and still cry for more? What manner of people are we that we permit our government to give away billions of the American taxpayers' dollars to Israel every year, enabling it to continue to subjugate the Palestinian people. What manner of people are we, the Americans? This man is an American, Alice F. Smith from Santa Barbara, California, in the Times Magazine, February 20th, 1989. There are people who are waking up to the situation and this will create either you change or destined for destruction.